G'day, folks. Talk to Eric Legrand, a New Jersey native and quadriplegic entrepreneur. And where we talk about his accident, traumatic period, where it all happened on the American football field, playing for Rutgers University, Division I football, and what he's done post-injury. The accolades, SB awards, symbolic drafting to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and more. And where he's at now, embarking on new ventures, into the coffee scene, doesn't stop. He's solid. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe button. It'd be much appreciated. And we've got a Patreon page. So if you want to become a part of the squad and help support the channel, hit the link. It'd be great. And want to thank our sponsors, Permanbill Australia, the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here. And they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, let's get into it. Okay, Eric, how are you, brother? I'm doing well, Jake. How are you, mate? I'm marvelous. Just want to say, really appreciate it jumping on the Keep Rolling podcast and just having a yarn about you know yourself and what you've gone through with life and. You know, how you, you impressed me a lot, my friend, like just, you know, young entrepreneur having a crack and, and I just wanted to let you know too that, um, yeah, like, you know, I'm a quadriplegic too and, and like our, our injuries are only 10 months apart, 10 months and nearly to the day. Wow. Really? Yeah. When was yours? So mine was January 2010. Okay. Yeah, on the on the seventeenth. Oh wow! So yeah, I was October 16, 2010. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 We well, you don't muck around, mate. You you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying my best to you know make the best of my situation and not let this injury hold me back from doing you know some amazing things in this world i know a lot of physical things have been taken away from us but we can still make a difference each day that's it like you're putting it right there brother it doesn't matter on your limitations it's like your ability within your disability and that's whenever you got a disability or not if you're you're still showing what you've got which you do tenfold like you're still having a go which is great you know yeah absolutely like i said this this happened to me. I was 20 years old. I was, you know, living my dream, but um, I said, I don't want to live a long, miserable, always upset life. And, you know, God willing, I live for many, many more years. You know, I want to make the best out of my time here. I see. So tell us a bit about your life, because I can see in the background there, like with your jersey, and it seems like a lot of your life has revolved around American football, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, since I was five years old, actually. It was crazy. We used to play this game called Kill the Man with the Ball. I decided to ask that Kill the Man with the Ball was one guy gets the ball and there's however how many people are playing at the time, you have to try to get past all of them and score. or And then you count how many times you score. Or you get tackled, and when you get tackled, you throw the ball up, and the person who picks it up, they have a crack at it next. Then... <laughs> and it's, it's and, but then from there, started playing flag football to getting all the way through Papa Warner to high school. You know, was you know blessed enough to receive Division One scholarships and got a full ride to go play at Division One college here in my in my home state of New Jersey and went to Rutgers University and that's where it all happened. Yeah, and that's you know it's pretty impressive, like with Rutgers University and and. How did it feel just being able to play in, like growing up, loving football and being able to play in your home state? Oh, it was awesome, you know, being able to be in this area where I grew up. You know, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of good good football players in this in this state. New Jersey. We are a very small state with a lot mm-hmm. of people. Small, like we're, like we're not by square, you know, square miles and stuff. 
we're not a huge state, but we got a lot of people, 9 million people that live in our state. And there's a lot of talent and being able, wow. to, being able to play here in New Jersey and be able to, at the time, you know, Rutgers wasn't really, at, well, before I got there, there was a lot of down years. But when I started to get recruited there was the years that they really started to turn it on. And I wanted to be a part of that and represent here in my home state and be a part of the first to do it. The first ones, not go somewhere else in the country and be just, yeah. you know, another, another another mark on a on a greatness. Now I wanted to be the first ones to try to do it here at Rutgers. That's great. And what drew you to that particular university? Was it the style of play or coaching staff or anything like that or? Definitely the coaching staff, Coach Greg Schiano, who was my head coach, you know, just the way that he talks to you. He looks literally, even when he's looking at you, it's eye contact, you know, very serious. And he takes 18-year-old boys and turns them into 21, 22-year-old men. And being able to develop that relationship with him, he put us through some tough times. It wasn't always easy and it wasn't always fun, but it was setting us up for life outside of football, the real world. And if, you know, God, if we had the God given talents to make it to the NFL, he prepared us for that as well. Yeah. And mate, you had the talent slot and to jump in as a defensive tackle. So, mm-hmm. which is, that's a prim- a pretty prominent spot within like on the field and within the roster. Yeah. And like, and how did it feel playing that role? Well, it was actually crazy because I was actually recruited to play another position and I, I was not the size that I needed to be when I got put into that role. Usually the guys that get into that defensive tackle role, you know, between 280 and 315 pounds, I was 230 pounds and I got thrown in there. And let's just say <laughs> my first few weeks of practice were not fun. <laughs> I was getting thrown around. But, you know, it, was, it was a whole learning experience trying to fight for my own down there, fend for my own. But, you know, I learned and gra- started grasping the position and realized, you know, my coach was looking at the future, not just right now. And I grew into yeah. that position and played it. Yeah. And that's saying who you are as a person. Like you just saying that to me now, brother, like it doesn't matter on, you know, on your size, like some of these other guys weigh X amount of pounds, but you're, you know, on there holding your own. And so, you know, cause I talk to various people with disabilities or, or, mm-hmm. or not where they go through trauma in their life and, and what it means to them. But like, what did it feel like on the 25 yard line mm-hmm. on that day in MetLife stadium mm-hmm. on that particular day when, when it all happened, like, what did it feel like? Can you walk us through those steps, brother? Yeah, it was like my life was over and we had just tied the game up. 17 and 17 in the fourth quarter, five minutes left. I'm running down on a kickoff to make a tackle like I've done hundreds of times before. And I remember getting through the, the, the two guys that were blocking me and I said, this is going to be a big collision. Let me use my shoulder and keep my head out of this tackle because I know it's going to be a big tackle. My teammate gets down there a little bit before I did. At a half a second, he dove at the guy's legs. Malcolm Brown got tripped up and his body twirled in the air. And as I put my head down, thinking it wasn't going to be an tackle at all. Crowd of my head goes right into the back of his shoulder blades. And next thing you know, I'm laying on the ground. Last thing I feel is my legs hit the ground that my heels hit after I went stiff. Mm-hmm. Can't move, can't breathe. And my training staff is in my face talking to me and my head coach is telling me I have to pray. Scariest moment of my life. Yeah, that's pretty scary. But, but the thing is, it seems like, you know, straight away you've you had a lot of support in and around you while you're going through that mm-hmm. period. And what was, what was going through your head? Like once you, you would have been on the stretcher and just, and you know, you couldn't breathe, you're going through all sorts of pain and then you can't feel certain things. Cause obviously to do with the spinal cord injury. So what, what was there a certain mantra or something that was going through your head or scared or what was going on, brother? I was terrified. I was I'm getting carted off the field. I wasn't, I thought I'd knock the wind out of myself and I would be okay. And I thought I had a full body stinger that everything will come back. And I went yeah. to give a thumbs up to the crowd and it just felt like there was a thousand pound center block laying on my hand and getting into the ambulance. I'm thinking once they put the oxygen mask on me, cause I was ignorant to the fact of what an oxygen mask actually does for you. I'm yeah. thinking once they put it on, I'm going to be able to 
inhale and exhale them when I like I wanted to. They put it on. I went to inhale it, and I wasn't able to exhale, and I uh, blacked out. I yeah. Blacked out. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so then that's when, obviously, that's when they would have started hooking up ventilators and oxygen machines and just yeah. helping getting the lung capacity back. It would have been along the lines of that, was it? Or yeah, well, it was rushing me to the hospital from there, and you know, get me into the hospital and, and going through all the. Obviously, you know, put me on oxygen, but going through the MRIs and CAT scans and seeing what the damage was that I had done and immediate planning for emergency surgery, right? Yep. Okay. And then you've gone through that. And that's a scary period, brother. Like I've gone, you know, through similar circumstances, but different. But it seems like, so it was a pretty good hospital system that you're in too, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I was taken to the, you know, the best hospital possible that was in that area. To get there was Hackensack Medical here in New Jersey, and they're a trauma one unit, so they were prepared for me, you know, on my primary arrival and whatnot. Yeah, and going through your rehabilitation process, and what I am really, really impressed with is just your willingness to mm-hmm. to breathe, keep, you know, get the lungs pumping, get moving. Like you, you don't hear that often at all brother like you you're on a, a, a ventilated quadriplegic this is from what i've read right so mm-hmm. you're told you're a ventilated quad is that is that correct you're getting told that by the medical staff i want they tell me i'll be on a ventilator for the rest of my life and uh you know they, through the grace of god you know i was off of that ventilator then six to eight weeks so <laughs> it was pretty incredible but um yeah that was uh that was a tough time period being that ventilator I you know, still have this car right here. It was yep. not fun at all. No. And that's and what well, that's pretty scary. You know, all you know, myself, I've been on one temporarily and and come off, but just knowing what it's like to keep breathing. But you've been mm. told you've been on that for life, and then you've just gone, nah, I'm off it, you know. And then yeah, that's I, I was gonna say, I, I was fighting whatever I needed to do just. I couldn't sleep with it. The noise, the sound, the uncomfortableness of it wrapped around my neck. It was just horrible. So I asked the respiratory therapist if she would take me off one night. And she did tell me I would last one minute. And an hour and a half later, I was still breathing on my own. And after that, they started to wean me off of it, you know, for the next few weeks until I didn't need it anymore. Jeez. You know, that's, you know, that's been stubborn, but that's been stubborn in a good way. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the stubbornness that I've always had it with, and with it, we came out for the good in that situation. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and so you going through the rehabilitation process and what I want to touch on is that Jersey behind you, the team mm-hmm. that you're representing. So you've mm-hmm. gone through it. You, you've gone through, you know, obviously scary dark times and you've gone, no, right. I'm off the ventilator, breathing again, steps are moving forward. And, you know, as a quadriplegic, but what did it feel like? Like you've gone through that process and wheeling out on the field with the Rutgers again Mm -hmm. for the first time post injury. What, what did that feel like just getting out on the field with, your brothers now with the coaching staff, all of the whole organization and university. It was awesome. 2011, October 29th, it was. Got to go out there. It was a snowstorm blizzard. I remember everyone was like, E, are you going to still do this? And I was like, all the adversity I've been through over the past year, I promised the team I was coming out versus West Virginia. Got to keep my word to it. And it was for a reason cold. And as you know, as a quadriplegic, we have a hard time regulating our temperature and whatnot. So, that was a tough one for me, but I said I was going to do it. I remember I got the dreaded as soon as I got in the tunnel and I heard my teammates coming down the, the, the tunnel to meet up with me. My adrenaline just started flowing and then we rolled out to the field. And I remember Coach Shiano brought it up and said, Lord, hail this man. Family on three, one, two, three, family. And I saw my roommate Brandon Jones from freshman year start crying. And then our middle linebacker start crying. And that was one of the times I Almost choked up and lost it. I got the frog in my throat. I was like, <laughs> but then I got it together and I was able to enjoy the moment and rolled off the field. That's awesome. And 
what did it mean to the boys? Like that's huge. Like to the yeah. to the team. Like that's oh man. Those are my guys. Those those are my guys. It was a special moment. People on my teammates behind me throwing up the five two, you know, leaning me out there, everyone coming up to me, slapping me in my shoulder, giving me a hug. All that. It was oh man, gives you chills down your spine. Yeah, and talking about chills, because you just talking about snow and blizzards and because yeah. like, you know, down here in Australia, we're the you know, we're the driest continent on earth. It doesn't it snows in bits and places, but you just talking about snow makes me feel cold, <laughs> Oliver. Yeah, I have no idea what it's like here in the northeast of New Jersey, man. This we get our, our weather is all types of craziness so up here. Cold, <laughs> cold, rain, hot, sunny, windy, every we get everything here. And how do you go with like with your internal thermostat and regulating your temperature all right or and uh, it's just, I keep my room at 80 degrees. I have a, a heated fan on. Everyone that comes in my room always dies. <laughs> They're like it's so hot, it's so hot in here. Blah, blah, blah. You know, stripping down to t-shirts and undershirts because it's so hot in here. But yeah, I, I always say I'm like a bear in the wintertime, I hibernate. Yeah. Then I come back out in, in like the spring summer. <laughs> that's awesome and what and and talking about awesome is the nfl and mm-hmm. and the drafting situation like and that's why you know because i'm a big fan of um new era hats and um mm-hmm. i don't know if you can see the, the i see the tampa of, bay yeah there we I are i can see the, the, shape of, <laughs> the shape of florida with the tampa bay logo in there I see you don't play, right? Yeah, but yeah. So, <laughs> so talk us about talk to us about that 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 drafting period and yeah. and Tampa Bay and just what that means to you. Yeah, so Koshiano left Rutgers at the end of the 2011 season and took a job with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2012, and that would have been the year that it was my draft class if I never got injured. Mm-hmm. And I remember after the draft is over. You know, they were figuring out their roster spots and you're allowed 90 men on your roster in the offseason. And they had 89 players. And then with the 90th player, he gives me a call up and we're just talking about school, life in general. And then he goes, well, with our 90th spot, we want you to fulfill that spot. And we want to sign you to our 90-man roster and you want to be a part of the Tampa Bay organization. We want to bring you down here, get you to meet the, you know, the owners, the coaching staff, the team, and get to be a part of our organization because we want our players to epitomize what you go through, which how you fight and live your, live your life each and every day. And let me just tell you, over the two years that he was there, I went down there like 10 times, got to see what it was like to be in the NFL, sign a contract, get the swag. You know, it was just an awesome moment. And I was so thankful and I can, I can never be more appreciative for coaching the Glazer family and everyone else a part of that whole idea and situation. Yeah. See, you're still a baller, brother. Doesn't matter, you right. know. <laughs> trying, man. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> you're modest. Come on. No, but, and, yeah, well, you look at that that organization and, you know, looking at Mr. Brady jumping on board with him last right. year and, and taking that. So is that an organ? So what's the organization that you grew up following as a kid? I'm a diehard Denver Broncos fan. Crazy because. I live in New Jersey. Most of the people in New Jersey support New York Giants and the New York Jets. I was watching Terrell Davis. He was a football player, running back. As a kid, I was eight years old. I said, I like him. I'm going to follow that team. And here I am at 30 years old now, 22 years later, still supporting the Denver Broncos, which is mm, thousands of miles away from my house. But I love love the Denver Broncos. And, you know, I always, uh, of course, keep up with the Buccaneers after everything they did for me. And, yeah. After they just won the Super Bowl this past season was a pretty cool moment. I said they should send me a Super Bowl ring. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, and so <clears throat> so you've been in in the media over the years, and like, and where you've been traveling your country, and and with a lot of that, like, and going back to the NFL draft and where I'm talking about adversity and what you've gone through with life and what's important to you and how you're talking to others. So has that, and that's opened the door to some NFL teams over the years where have you been 
talking to some of the other teams and like whether if it's got to do with NFL college and and just talking to them about what you've gone through and how maybe that you can pass something off to them before they run out onto the field? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because NFL football community, even though we, we go to battle against each other, we're a very tight-knit community. So a lot of the players and obviously the coaches, they remember my injury and when it happened and being in the media and all of that. So when I go to games sometimes, like when they're – I go to a lot of Giants and Jets games when – some of my other friends have their, you know, they their their teams come in town and you want to see, we go to MetLife Stadium and, you know, when I see, the, if I go on the field and you get to see other players and the coaches, they recognize me and they come up to me and they, you know, show their love and, you know, their gratitude and just this and that. So, yeah, it's definitely opened the door to relationships with other, you know, players in the NFL because we just, we all get it. We understand the grind and the hustle and they tell me how I've inspired them. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and mate, pretty cool. You know, it's more than cool because an SB award. How'd that? How'd that come about? That's awesome. You know, it's showing like you don't have to. You're wheeling about, doing life, still grinding, hustling, and you still and these awards and accolades mm-hmm. are still coming on. Like, just talk us through this whole period and what you're doing and getting these awards and what it means. Yeah, this was, you know, fairly still new into my injury because I won the Jimmy V. War for Perseverance in, at the ESPYs in June of 20, 2012. So this was, you know, almost this nine, nine years ago. And I was still had, you know, still figuring out my journey, but still fighting and, you know, overcoming adversity and pushing through. And they had reached out to my broadcasting agent and told me that I was, I was up for one of the finalists for the award and they were, keep me updated and my agent calls me up and said Eric you won the Jimmy V War for Perseverance and I was I think I was on my way to get a haircut at the time and I was like holy shit like <laughs> it was like it was crazy I was celebrating I'm like I had planned out flying like 40 people out there <laughs> I was like everybody got to come the whole time but obviously that's people was like whoa 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 <laughs> we'll, allow, we'll allow we'll allow you to have 10 so it was we we filled those 10 spots up and it was just a crazy because you go there you see all these different athletes and celebrities that mm. you see on tv but when i when i got there you know some a lot of them recognized me and they came and said hello but after my speech and then when there's an after party afterwards i was the one that everyone wanted to take a picture with <laughs> insane insane and they're having fun with the gronkowski brothers and just a moment that i'll never forget that's awesome, you know, and like at the end of the day, and they're just, and it's like the way that you look at these stars, but they're just people too at the end of the day. Hey, so mm-hmm. yeah, so that's huge, you know, and nice yeah, and what's it? So has it shown other people that not just the NFL, the American football community, but like I'm talking about other people with disabilities in your home state or around the country. So how's it been like being in touch with that community and how's that shown what you can do and uplift some of the other people around you that are going through similar situations? Yeah, I've gotten shoot being in this this chair now and this injury for now 10 and a half years. I've gotten to see some crazy stories. Unfortunate mm. situations, great situations, overcoming stories, and some stories that don't end so well. So it opens your eyes and just gives you a, a newfound of appreciation on life. Yeah. And the things that you can do, the people that you have in your life, and motivates me to do more because I know it's crazy to say so many people, they would like to even be in my situation, being able to share their story all the time, mm. being able to do this, being able to, I'm like, you know what? I'll never take any of this for granted because mm. I know somebody that doesn't, may, may not have the same support system as me but be would be just as willing they don't have that same opportunity and that's why i'm i'll never you know i'm always going to push and advocate for people that are in similar situations as me to share light on their stories and bring awareness so one day we can find a cure for this so people yep. could be able to not be in the shadow or not you know be afraid to have a disability or you know things like that i want to just bring as much awareness and love and you know gratitude and also be able to help them through tough situations and give them, I get calls and emails all the time 
about someone, unfortunately, someone, un, you know, with a new spinal cord injury and just mm-hmm. trying to talk with their family and trying to get them through those initial stages in the very beginning. See, that's super important. Like that end note that you said there too, like when it's talking to people, when it's, when they first had their injury, because like, as you'd know, just, just with life and how, you know, life was what, what it once was. And then that flip, flip of a switch. And then it's, it feels like, you know, the, the earth has just been taken from under you and it's just trying to deal with, and it's not just the person that's going through with the disability. It's a whole ripple effect, like their family, their partners, community. So that's, that's awesome to hear that, you know, people are reaching out and you're able to, you know, if it's not just telling your story, but, you know, saying if it's helping anybody in any way, shape or form, because like, as you said, and I've had similar circumstances where it's talking to people with disabilities or it's a spinal cord injury or other where they might be in a fortunate situation, but they're not willing to give it a go. And like some people can end up down that end of the spectrum in sort of in the middle or up the other spectrum like you and what, where you're pushing for forward perseverance, you know, keeping the wheels turning. That's what it's all about, brother, you know? So, and that's what I'm, yeah. And that's where, Mate, it seems like you're going like a hundred thousand miles ahead, and it's yeah. and it's venture after venture, and we're going into your latest venture, Le Grand Coffee House. Like, so you, so you love coffee that much, eh? You thought you just said, yeah, I'm gonna just start a brew house, and you know, and that that's bringing in community. And the thing, the crazy part about it is, it was actually the exact opposite. I never even had a cup of coffee until August of 2020. And I, but to what you just said at the end, everything that's been going on in the world, especially in the United States over the past, you know, year and the COVID and everything and the election, it's, just, it's been a lot of negative stuff. And I say, when people look at me, what do like, they need to look at me, inspiration, motivation, overcoming obstacles, handling adversity. And I said, what do people love and what do people need? And I'm like, coffee, they need that every single day. So I want to be, I created my brand, LeGrand Coffee House, to remind, give that people that daily affirmation, that reminder of mm. put it, not letting the negatives creep in. Be a good person. Handle your business by overcoming adversity, mm. being able to bring people together. And that's why we created our, our little slogan that's bringing unity to the community with a daily cup of belief. You got you to gotta remind people every single morning or uh. when they need that little picking up in the afternoon. You know, that's what it's all about. That's awesome. And it's, cl- and it's pretty close to home too, is it? Yeah, but it's 1.7 miles away from my house. So right down the road, you know, not too far away at all. It's right, right in my hometown of Woodbridge, New Jersey. Yep. I'm excited yep. about it. I can't wait to get my foundation involved more. I okay. team with the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation and hopefully being able to help people with disabilities who might have a, or, you know, want to be a future barista, you know, bring them on out. I'm going to try and make sure that our place is fully handicap accessible and yep. people can have full access to it. So I'm excited to see what we do at LeGrand Coffee House and as well as integrating Team LeGrand of the Chris Dana Reed Foundation because we actually have one of our events coming up, a Walk to Believe, which is our annual 5K that we do. And, you know, to raise the funds for your spinal cord injury research. And since we're doing it virtually, we want people all around the world to do it. Like we had 10, 10, sta- uh, 10 countries do it last year. I, I don't know if all- Australia was in there. They might have been. So if not, we got to get yeah. someone from Australia to participate this year for our walk to believe it's going to be on June 12th. But yeah, we're like, we're for like the highest fundraisers and the highest team. Like we're going to work on to give them some, some free coffee, you know, stuff like that. So okay. uh, that's how I can't wait to keep on tying, you know, the coffee house and, and tying into our foundations. That makes total sense. And mate, hopefully this coffee house, that's the first of many, you know, yeah. get that get the franchise out brother uh, you know i'm trying man. it's gonna be that that first one is gonna be be the one that you know skyrockets the rest of the business that's it and and um also with your coffee you know it'd be good when um when that gets rolling on and if you want to start 
shipping that stuff overseas, mate. I'll be grabbing a packet for sure, you know. <laughs> hey, and when, once we really get it, we, we got our online store going now. We, are, yep. uh, we just, we've been up and running for about four months and we sold to all 50 states and now, so as we get, we keep on evolving, don't worry, we're going to start making it internationally it. so we can get you some coffee all the way out there. I see. Australia. Crikey, <laughs> <laughs> mate. <laughs> Gotta get you some of that coffee, mate. Say you got an accent down pack, brother. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so, mate, I really appreciate your time. And the thing is, before like we like wrap it up, I want to just talk about Walk to Believe. Mm-hmm. So, you've... You know, you're at this point now, you've got you, the coffee house, you've done, you've got accolades behind you, you've got a great platform. And for quadriplegics over in the States, but not just over there, over at, like, you know, I'm talking to you now, I'm in Australia. You know, there's people all over the world that watching what you're doing and that are inspired, including myself. So, and just say, so, talk to us about Walk to Believe, mate. I appreciate that. Like I said, a walk to believe is our annual 5k. This will be our 11th annual this year. And it was all started from a woman who doesn't even like American football. Doesn't didn't know anything about it, but she felt for my brother and she has two sons and she just came up to visit me when I was in my inpatient rehab at Kessler Institute here in West Lawrence, New Jersey. And she said, I want to do something. A lot of people want to do something. They say that, but she followed through with this. She partnered up with Rutgers, the university, and they started a 5K. He said, maybe, you know, we'll do it one year. We'll raise a bunch of money and that'll help. But people had such a great time. And we started to build a community with it. And we started to get more people with spinal cord injuries out there and started bringing people together. And it comes around like an all around. It's like a little festival. We have our sponsors out there with their tables and, and stuff. Represent. We have um, the basketball games going on. There's the 5K. There's the run, roll, walk part of it that everyone's participating. It becomes a family event. And we just had so much fun with it that we're here with our 11th annual one. And like I said, last year, due to COVID, we had to do it virtually, which we're doing again. And it was our best year. We raised $190,000, had all 50 states, two U.S. territories participate and 10 countries. So now we got to do it even bigger this year. We got to get we got to get people from all over the world, because like I said, well, you just mentioned before, it's not just about the spinal cord injuries here in America. It's all over the world. We got to find a cure for everybody, not just here in the United States. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm going to make sure that, and if that's okay with you, like I'm going to, like with the podcast, I'm going to add a link like to where we can find where the the virtual event is because that's really important, you know, because it's just having that belief. And if we can get more people, doesn't matter if it's in the States or wherever it is, and and that's awesome having the virtual platform so that. You could be anywhere. You could be anywhere in the world and, Wherever you are, if you want to do it in your neighborhood, you want to go to your local track, whatever you want to do, but make sure you do your 5K that day. Take a picture or video and you just upload it to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and she'll let us know that, hey, I participated in a walk to believe today. Awesome. Brother, well, before we wrap it up, let's look at, do you want to throw some of your, how do people contact you? Like if it's got to do with your social media, emails or whatever it may be what's the best way to people to know what eric legrand's about coffee house or the or to do walk to believe talk us through it it's definitely um definitely a social media and my website's like at eric legrand 52 so e-r-i-c-l-e-g-r-a-n-d 52 that's all my that's my twitter that's my instagram my facebook is just eric legrand and then our, our foundation is team legrand so t-e-a-m-l-e-g-r-a-n-d you can go to our website, our Instagram, with all our information on our events, a walk to believe and everything that we're going to be doing going forward. And yeah, just get a part of it. If you're in the States, get you some of that LeGrand coffee house, but don't worry. When we get, when we start shipping international, I hope to have a big presence of LeGrand coffee house out there in Australia. <laughs> hey, I'll be one of the first. That's for sure. I appreciate that, my brother. All right. Thanks brother. Really appreciate your time. And mate hopefully we're talking soon and you know i'll be getting some beans out here over down under and you know be having a hot a a hot brew and yeah and let and then coming up to june and then we'll be looking at 
your foundation there and what it represents and and then get that virtual event across the world. Thanks, mate. Absolutely, my man. I appreciate you having me on. You take care of yourself. Over and out, brother. All right. See, this bloke, he don't slow down. This brew house, coffee house, that'll be the first of many, I reckon. And hopefully these beans start shipping to the southern hemisphere. I'm going to get me hands on some. Love coffee. You hear that, Eric? Doing good work. Keep it up. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe button. Be much appreciated. And we've also got a Patreon page. So if you want to help further support the channel and become a part of the squad, hit the link. That'd be great. And if you want to get in contact with me, you can get me via Instagram at Street Rolling Cheetah or email one word Street Rolling Cheetah at gmail.com. And we've also got a Facebook page, Keep Rolling with Jake Briggs. So check it out. I want to thank our sponsors, Permanville Australia, greatest electrical chairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here, and they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, see you on the next one.